subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for the latest updates and notifications. Hello everyone, I want to tell you about a man named Robert Durst. Even though he was born into a very rich family, his life has been linked with many murder cases. People often thought he was guilty, but somehow he always managed to avoid punishment. His life is like a mystery and is quite fascinating. The more you learn about him, the more it might scare you. Robert Durst is a legendary figure from New York and is sometimes called a disaster star. In the US, almost every news channel has covered stories about the Durst family, and Robert Durst is the most famous among them. He was born in 1943, the eldest son of Seymour Durst, a well-known real estate mogul in New York. The Durst family is famous across the country, just like the Trump family. They own over a dozen skyscrapers in Manhattan, which shows their influence and wealth. Robert Durst, the main character of our story today, was born rich. But how did he get involved in so many murder cases? And how did he manage to avoid punishment every time? Let's start our story on September 30th, 2001, to find out more. Let's dive into the events of September 30th, 2001, in Texas, United States. Our focus shifts to a small island called Galveston, located in the southeastern part of Texas, about 80 kilometers southeast of Houston. Galveston is situated next to the West Bay and is known for its beautiful beaches and pleasant climate, making it a popular vacation destination. Many people choose to come here to escape the hustle and bustle of the city. On the evening of September 30th, a father and son were fishing by the beach in West Bay. Suddenly they noticed several black garbage bags not far away. Some bags were floating on the water, while others had washed ashore. Curious, the father and son decided to pick up one of the bags. To their astonishment, they discovered a handgun inside. Startled, they quickly dropped the bag and ran, then called the police to report their findings. Upon receiving the report, the Texas police immediately dispatched officers to the scene. After a thorough search, they discovered a total of 20 pieces of human tissue belonging to a male body. Apart from the head, all other body parts were recovered. In one of the garbage bags, the police found a newspaper. Despite being soaked for a long time, the text on the newspaper was still legible. The address written on the paper was 221 K Street, number 3, which happened to be close to Weston, where the incident took place. The police went to K Street, number 2, assuming it was the correct address. In room 1, they discovered the body of a 71-year-old man named Black, confirmed through fingerprints. This made the occupant of room 2, an elderly mute woman named Selina, a person of interest. The police noticed two pairs of women's shoes outside room 2, leading them to obtain a search warrant. Inside, they found a sparsely furnished house, not resembling the living quarters of an elderly woman. When they uncovered a sheet in the kitchen, they discovered scratches on the floor and bloodstains beneath it, identified as Black's blood. The police deduced that the murder of Black had taken place in room 2. In the backyard's trash can, they found a receipt from an eye clinic for glasses pickup, signed by Robert Durst. Surprisingly, Durst had actually shown up on the scheduled day to collect his glasses, which caught the police off guard. He was caught by the police on the spot. In the trunk of the car he was sitting in, the police found a tool that greatly increased his suspicion of committing the crime. After investigation, the police found out that the two old women were disguised by Durst as men. He used the name of his high school classmate for the old woman's name. Then, the police told Durst that he would be charged with first-degree murder, and his bail was set at $300,000. Durst said to the police, I don't have that much money right now. He didn't have $300,000, but he asked to make a phone call, and Durst called his wife Debbie in New York. The next day, $300,000 was transferred to his account. You have to know that $300,000 is not a small amount, and the police were stunned at the time. Soon, the news of Durst's suspected murder was discovered and reported by a newspaper in New York and Durst didn't show up at his first hearing. Apparently, he had fled. But not long after, Durst, who had shaved his head, stole a sandwich from a supermarket and was caught by the security guard. The police arrived at the supermarket and arrested him. What you didn't expect was that the police found $38,000 in cash in Durst's car parked at the door. He had so much money, but he still had to steal a sandwich. In addition to the cash, the police also found two guns, and the victim Black's driver's license in the car. Obviously, this became another important evidence of Durst's murder of his neighbor Black. Next, he faced a charge of first-degree murder. 
In fact, this was not the first time that Durst was known to the public for being involved in a case. Over 20 years ago, Durst was implicated in his first wife's disappearance. In 1973, at the age of 30, Durst married Kathy, a 21-year-old woman. They moved out of New York City and bought a villa in South Salem, far from the busy city life. The villa was located near a lake and had beautiful surroundings. However, their marriage started to deteriorate over time, leading to frequent arguments and escalating conflicts. In Kathy's diary, she mentioned several times that she caused physical harm to herself during their fights. Then, on January 31, 1982, a Sunday afternoon, Kathy was driving to a gathering at her friend Gilbert's house. During the event, Durst called Kathy and told her not to come home immediately. After the phone call, Gilbert noticed that Kathy was trembling and extremely anxious. Before leaving, Kathy expressed her fear that Durst might harm her and asked Gilbert, who was addressed as doctor, to check on her if something happened. Unfortunately, Gilbert didn't pay much attention to her words as he was unaware of the situation. Gilbert agreed to visit Kathy to offer comfort, unknowing it would be their final meeting as Kathy disappeared thereafter. Four days later, Durst reported Kathy missing to the police. He claimed that on Sunday afternoon, Kathy left their South Salem home for Gilbert's party. Kathy returned home at 7:30 p.m., showing signs of having had some drinks but not being drunk. During an argument, Kathy insisted on going back to their New York apartment alone, but Durst advised her not to drive. As a compromise, Kathy decided to take the 917 train. Durst drove her to the Katona station at 8:30 p.m. Afterward, Durst returned home and encountered his neighbor, Mr. Grad, whom he chatted with over a drink. Durst then took a solitary walk until 11.15 p.m. when he called their Manhattan apartment from a roadside payphone to check if Kathy had arrived. Kathy answered the phone and said she was watching TV. The doorman of the apartment also confirmed that Kathy had entered the building and went to the penthouse on the 15th floor. A few days later, the medical school where Kathy was studying called and said that Kathy had not been to class for several days. It was then that Durst realized that Kathy was missing. After listening to Durst's description, the police thought it was just a normal missing case. It seemed that the couple was having a conflict and one of them ran away from home. They had seen too many cases like this. Maybe Kathy would come back in a few days, so the police did not follow up. Then, Durst issued a reward notice, hoping that someone who knew something could provide clues. After Kathy's disappearance was exposed, her friend Gilbert thought that her disappearance must have something to do with Durst, because he clearly remembered what Kathy said to him when she left that day. Gilbert saw the police's irresponsible attitude in handling the case. Gilbert and his friends, lacking trust in the police, took matters into their own hands. They visited Kathy's house one night and gathered all the trash outside, dumping it on the ground. Among the discarded items were Kathy's personal belongings, clothes, textbooks, cosmetics, a hairdryer, and her diary. These findings suggested that Durst knew Kathy would never return. During their search, they came across a note with the unsettling phrase, garbage dump shovel rental, implying a connection to disposing of a body. However, this evidence remained circumstantial and couldn't be considered conclusive by the police. The person who claimed to have shared drinks with Durst refuted the statement, denying any acquaintance with him. This contradicted Durst's account. Additionally, investigations revealed that Durst's alleged phone call to the Manhattan apartment on the night of Kathy's disappearance was fabricated. While Durst maintained he drove Kathy to the train station, there was no way to verify this claim. During the time when Kathy disappeared, the whole of New York was in chaos and everyone believed that Durst must have been involved. However, there wasn't enough proof, so the police treated the case as a regular incident. After 20 years, the case was reopened because the police arrested a man named Martin. He spoke up and said that he knew Kathy had been poisoned and killed in a lakeside villa in South Salem in 1982. The police quickly went to the lakeside villa in South Salem. The villa had been sold to someone else and Durst no longer owned it. Interestingly, this was the first time the police had searched the villa. The local police had never searched Durst's home before. During their search, they found a secret door hidden behind a closet. When they opened it, they discovered a secret storage area. The current owner of the house was also surprised because they had no idea that such a place existed. These hiding spots seemed amazing but unfortunately, the police didn't find anything after searching the entire house and the lake nearby. 
the police found out that the doorman of the Manhattan apartment, who said that Kathy returned to the apartment that night, was not provided by the police, but by the Durst group. In this way, whether Kathy really returned to the Manhattan apartment that night became a big question mark. It turned out that a few days before Kathy disappeared, Kathy had hired a lawyer and asked Durst for a divorce. This included the division of property. Durst refused Kathy's divorce request after being entrusted. Three days after that, Kathy disappeared. Was this all just a coincidence? The police at that time did not search Kathy's villa or Durst's car. Durst walked to the police station to report the case and did not drive. What was he worried about? Was there any secret hidden in the trunk of the car? The police found Kathy's friends again and they unanimously said that there was a person named Susan who was her best friend. Susan had known her since college and might know some of her secrets. Note, Susan does not live in New York now, but in Los Angeles, California. Until the police were ready to go to Los Angeles to find Susan and investigate the situation, something unexpected happened again. On December 24, 2000, the Los Angeles Police Department received a 911 call. Someone claimed that their neighbor's door was always open and no one answered. They hoped the police would come and take a look. The address was 1527 Benedict Canyon. This address was the home of Susan, Durst's longtime best friend. Soon after receiving the call, the Beverly Hills Police Department sent someone to the scene. The police entered the house and found Susan lying on the floor. She was lying face up with a gunshot wound to the back of her head. The coroner determined that she had been dead for no more than 24 hours. The items at the scene were intact and there was no loss of property or signs of struggle. Therefore, the police judged that this case might have been committed by an acquaintance. A few days after the incident, something strange happened. The Beverly Hills Police Department received an anonymous letter with a misspelled address, 1527 Benedict Canyon, Corpse. The postmark indicated that the letter was sent the day before Susan's body was discovered, strongly suggesting it was sent by the killer. The intention seemed to be for the police to find Susan's body in her home promptly. This case appeared to be connected to Durst once again, as he was in California at the time. Prior to the incident, Susan's financial situation had worsened. She was behind on rent and had resorted to borrowing money to make ends meet. Later, Susan received substantial transfers of money from Durst. Speculations arose that Susan may have known about Durst's alleged attempt to harm Kathy that year, leading her to threaten Durst. She supposedly intended to reveal everything to the police if he didn't provide financial support. Durst, feeling challenged, thought, how dare you threaten me? Without wasting any time, he took care of things and made sure nobody would ever find out what really happened to Kathy when she disappeared. The police couldn't solve the case because there wasn't enough evidence to determine who killed Susan, making it a mystery that remained unsolved. However, the media kept bothering Durst by talking about Kathy's disappearance and Susan's case, which made him annoyed and upset. That's why Durst decided to go to his house in Texas. He disguised himself as an old woman named Weston and lived in a house, pretending to be unable to speak. And then, something happened, just like I mentioned earlier. Durst had to face a new investigation into Kathy's disappearance and also accusations of killing his neighbor, Blake, in Texas. To defend himself, Durst spent a lot of money, around $1.8 million, to hire two famous lawyers. In 2003, Durst went to trial in a Texas court for the Blake murder case and was charged with first-degree murder. Durst claimed that his neighbor, Blake, entered his room and threatened him with a gun. They fought, and during the struggle, the gun accidentally went off and shot Blake. Durst was scared and didn't want to call the police because he had been involved in two previous cases. If he had called the police, nobody would have believed his side of the story. He decided to dismember the person and throw the body into the sea. The defense lawyers provided a vivid account of his life. He came from a wealthy family, but at a young age, he tragically witnessed his mother's suicide by jumping from a roof. He was highly emotional and always carried a photo of his first wife with him. Durst had a condition called Asperger's syndrome, which is a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by difficulties in social interaction and nonverbal communication. These experiences garnered sympathy from the jury ultimately influencing their decision. Thanks to the impressive performance of his defense lawyers, the jury believed Durst's claim of self-defense. Consequently, 
the court declared him not guilty of first-degree murder and released him immediately. However, Durst faced a five-year prison sentence in the second year for evading parole and tampering with evidence. In 2010, a movie called All Good Things was released, which portrayed Kathy's disappearance and Susan's story. The film directly implicated Durst, who had already been released from prison, and he watched it himself. Durst contacted Rick, the director of the movie, who had multiple Oscar nominations for his documentaries. He wanted Rick to create a documentary where he could share his own version of events and reveal the truth of that year. Rick was highly interested in Durst's story. He knew the story very well and had always wanted to pursue the truth. Was Durst really the killer? So Rick gladly agreed to Durst's idea of making a documentary. Then, the documentary was launched. During this period, the production team re-examined all kinds of evidence and testimonies from that year. The director asked Durst all kinds of questions through interviews, and Durst answered them carefully and logically, as if there were no flaws. Durst also talked about how he was neglected in the family inheritance dispute by his grandfather. Durst's brother got him a bodyguard to stay safe. The people making the film started to feel sorry for Durst, and thought he might not have done anything wrong. But when they were almost done making the movie, they found something big. While they were filming, Susan's son found a letter that Durst had sent to Susan, but it was never given to the police. When the film people saw the letter, they felt scared. They saw that the word Beverly was spelled wrong. They remembered a different letter from a long time ago that also spelled Beverly wrong. They looked at both letters and saw they looked a lot alike. Because of this, they had a big meeting. They decided they needed to find the truth and help the police catch the bad guy. They planned to talk to Durst again and ask him hard questions about the letter to try and catch him in a lie. After the efforts of the production team, Duster agreed to the interview. When he asked the production team to bring out the latest evidence, Duster became more and more nervous. Even the director who asked the question seemed nervous. His hands were trembling slightly. At this point, he admitted that he wrote the letter to Susan, but denied writing the anonymous letter. As for why the two spouses had slightly similar spelling errors, and why they were so close to each other. He said he couldn't explain it. Then the production team turned off the camera and told Duster that the interview was over. However, the most exciting scene happened next, which made the production team turn off the camera. But the microphone on Duster's body was still on. I don't know if the production team did it on purpose or forgot to remind Bright to take me off. Then Duster went to the bathroom after the interview. His microphone was not turned off at this time, and everything was recorded. In the bathroom, he muttered to himself, if I were. Kill them all, of course. This documentary shocked the world when it aired. The production team handed over the new discoveries and new evidence to the police. A month later, Durst arrested in New Orleans by suspected murder of Susan ordered by Supreme Court, who believed there was sufficient evidence to link Susan's death to Durst, The case was scheduled to begin on March 2nd, 2020. Later, the defendant claimed that he had some relationship that might affect the fair trial of the case. Therefore, the court decided to try the case. Could Robert Durst escape the law again this time? Let's wait and see. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for the latest updates and notifications.